Welcome to e-commerce marketing with the Pitbulls, where we catch up with craft brands to hear their story and learn how they're growing their e-commerce channel. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are joined by Norm Farrar. Norm, I'm pronouncing that right? You are. Excellent. Norm is the uh, host of the popular podcast and uh, video series, Lunch with Norm. Um, He has, uh, I guess I was going to say over 20 years, but uh, I guess it's over 30 years at this point, um, going back to the 1990s, uh, working in the e-com space, um, does a lot with Amazon, Walmart, uh, uh, retail, I should say. Um, and has worked with a ton of Fortune 500 companies, including Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, and 20th Century Fox. Um, So really just a ton of experience. I can't wait to dive into this conversation. I think there's uh, a ton we can catch up on here, Norm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Awesome. All right. Um, So yeah, so you know, I gave a little bit of an intro there, but uh, why don't you kick it off by um, just letting our our uh, audience know a little bit more about yourself and kind of what you're um, really focused on these days. Well, I am an e-commerce fossil. Uh, back in the 90s, that's when I got started just by accident and have been heavily involved ever since. Uh, I've got a, a probably a, a really great, I not probably, I do have a great uh, uh, source of knowledge when it comes to manufacturing uh, came from a manufacturing background. So I, I was able to take that, take some of the e-commerce uh, experience that I have over the years and kind of put it all together. So uh, that's uh, kind of all that I can really say about that. Um, I do have a, a sourcing company as well. So what I, I think one of the main things that we have to do is find ways to be more profitable. And from what I've always found is the profit is really in the sourcing. So being able to take that, uh, get the best product at the best price and kind of chip off a percentage here and a percentage there, you can really enter into the, at least the Amazon game um, with a bit more profit in your pocket than your competition. Um, so, and one of the other things we we got talking before the podcast and I wanted to talk about a certain uh, topic today, but Probably one of the most important topics right now for all of e-commerce is perceived value. And you are only as good as how you're perceived. And you can double, triple, quadruple your profit. No profit problem. Just by coming out with a perceived value. And there's typically three different levels of perception on Amazon. Bottom dwellers, usually the Chinese, you know, a lot of bottom dwellers, the average and then the high. And if you can take advantage of the sourcing, come out at a higher level, better pictures, better quality copy, better everything, uh, then you can make a lot of money. Awesome. I love it. I feel like there's a ton to unpack there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really like that that focus on, you know, I guess I would sum all of that up kind of as margin and kind of looking at it from both sides. But that's one of the biggest things where we're really focused on e-commerce. We do a lot of Google ads and you know, a lot of times, especially from like a Google shopping perspective, not dissimilar from uh, the Amazon world, you know, really price point and perceived value become really important. And it's not so much we're not bidding a given, you know, cost per click anymore. We're typically bidding on a target ROAS or a target CPA, which gets to, you know, what's the margin and what what can you um, you know, what cost from an advertising perspective can you can you absorb? So one of our favorite things to do as we start up new clients is to kind of look at that, you know, marketing spend as a percentage of, you know, the total margin left over there. So, you know, total cost to create a product, get the product to the warehouse, get the product out to the customer, um, you know, really everything it takes to truly deliver an order um, you know, and then subtract that number from, you know, the, the you know, average order value. And I, I think that's, I love that you kind of take that from both sides. So it's not just price point, which is important, obviously. It's not just the sourcing side, which obviously is very important as well. Um, but yeah, kind of taking that holistic approach to how can we make that, that gap as big as possible? Because that's really, um, you know, we talk a lot about marketing, but your marketing is not going to be successful if you don't have a reasonably sized gap that you can afford to spend some marketing dollars in there. 
Right. Uh, yeah. And that's probably one of the biggest failures. If you're not properly capitalized, how are you going to succeed on Amazon or in e-commerce? So you've got to have that. A lot of new sellers forget about that part of it. The thing called marketing, <laughs> you know, yeah. they throw it all into inventory. And then when you have it in, in stock, well, I've run out of money. And I've seen that so many times. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about this. So you're, you're really focused in on perceived value right now. You mentioned yes. some of the items, you know, the the image that you're shooting, um, some of those other things. We we really like to focus on brand and, and storytelling and making sure that, you know, you're explaining what it is that makes your product so special. Um, tell us, do you have any specific strategies or anything that, that you like to focus on in that area? Yeah, I, I can actually give you a, a, a nice case study that uh, that happened. And it was with a knife company. So there's a lot of knives out there. Is it saturated? Well, everything's kind of saturated, but um, I'm really, and I don't know about you, but as long as you have a good quality brand at a good quality price, so that could be a very high perceived value price or a very low bottom price, wherever you want to come out. But I'm not really too scared about competition. This was a new seller, a new seller being a, a, a under a year old. And doing quite well, they were selling around 1,700 knives, but they came out at a really low, um, there was two knives, one that was selling at $29, the other one that's selling at $49. And these were excellent knives. One was a multi-purpose knife, the other one was a Damascus steel. Now, Damascus steel is a lot more expensive. And he had 1,700, he was selling on average 1,700 knives at 24 bucks. And he was also selling not as not quite as many about a not quite not near as many uh, at uh, at forty nine dollars for the Damascus steel. It was forty nine bucks. The competitors, when you take a look at it, I'm going to go back. Remember when I said about the 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 three different tiers? Every search that you do in Amazon, you're going to see that there's three levels of search. You're going to have your products that really cannibalize the profit you know, cannibalize each other. They just want to do volume and they're making nickels. Um, and usually people can't survive doing that. And, and that's usually new sellers just trying to compete to get sales. Then you've got the middle. And the middle are these prices that come out. And I'll give you an example, Dead Sea Mud. I did this uh, for a presentation I was doing the other day. It was, the bottom dwellers were coming out for eight to 16 ounces, uh, $7 to $14, believe it or not. Then there was a secondary level, which came out at around the 20, 24 to $49 level. It could go a little higher. And then there was the third that went from uh, 70, 74, 75 uh, up to over $90. Now, here's the difference. The high perceived value was only 3.5 ounces. Now, it's Dead Sea mud. It comes from the Dead Sea, and it's mud. How can one be six bucks and how can one be 95 bucks? Complete perception. And so I'm going to give you this with this knife. So the knife, I'll con let's concentrate on the, uh, the $49 one. So the, you could come out at that 49 to around a 60 ish range, $69 range. And I looked though, but it was way out of whack when I bought the knife <clears throat> because I wanted to get that customer experience. Well, it sucked. It, uh, it came in a plastic box with a uh, cardboard backing. It looked like something cheap out of China. So I, I asked uh, the client, I said, well, would you be open to repackaging it? Sure, no problem. So we created an outer box. We put it hard cardboard, uh, like a rigid box on the inside. It, was, it had magnetic clasps. We took EVA foam and die cut the knife, put it inside, had another piece of foam that covered it and had this welcome message when you opened up the flap. So now it looked pretty classy. And the knife uh, was acid etched uh, and the rivets going on to the, into the knife were acid etched and it was embossed. The, <clears throat> the outside of the one box was white with a full color process, like silhouette, just like a, um, an iPhone box and then a full color process in the back. So when somebody got it, 
It was anticipation, just like the iPhone box. You opened it up and you want to see the knife. Then when you opened up the second one, you popped it up. We didn't allow them to see the knife. We wanted them to, to take it, have that anticipation of seeing the knife because it was $49, whip de doo <laughs> And then we, uh, we said, okay, well, why don't we try putting it up? Uh, and, you know, he was $10. Okay, let's put it at $59. He said, let's, let's put it to 69. We didn't drop any traffic. Let's put it to 79. Let's put it to 89, 99. Let's put it to 124. And so now, if you go onto Amazon right now, the brand sell, sells between 99 and 124. We've put up the cost by just a buck or two, not even a, a two. It was about a buck 25 in packaging. And the landed cost was $16. Now, that's not bad. That's great. <laughs> On top of that, he didn't drop much traffic. So that was the key. So what I found was people didn't want cheap, crappy knives from China. They didn't even want the medium size. They wanted the higher ticket item because this is people who are going to buy a good quality um, a chef knife. A Damascus steel knife wanted quality. If you didn't want the quality, you could go to a multi-purpose, you know, steel carbon knife and pay 29 to 44 bucks. But we, we also played around with that knife, but it wasn't as, as, as good as uh, this one. So then we decided, okay, let's go back to the manufacturer. Let's see if they have any, uh, any thoughts on this. So could we get something at $16, but we can sell at a higher rate? And he, he said, well, we have another one that we hammer the steel. So it, it does look like it's got a higher perceived value. And we went, all right, let's take this knife. Let's put a different uh, handle on it. Let's put it into a wood package and just make it that much better. And we reversed the packaging. This was now their premium version, uh, their elite knives. And we put a black box with um, like sort of a gold imprint. Look beautiful. And we put it to 224. Same landed cost, 16 bucks, three dollars extra for the wood box and the extra packaging. 224. Now those didn't sell quite as much, but the profit range was quite high. Yeah. That's about that's what I talk about when I talk about perceived value. And we can do that all the time, day in and day out. So I'm I'm interested from that perspective. Um you know, uh, from like a packaging perspective. And, and I, I love that concept because it, we've all had that experience where you order from a new brand and it comes in and it's like you said, it's like the iPhone box kind of scenario where you're just, oh, you know, I figured I'd try it out. Why not? I, if you're talking about, you know, $10 versus $15, it probably doesn't matter that much. If you want to try the brand, you're willing to pay a little bit more um, for, you know, some of these things, especially on like an Amazon where everything's free shipping and all of this. And you get it in and then you say, wow, this like, you know, type of packaging that really pops and really, you know, yep. you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a customer of this forever. I'm showing my friends. I'm, you know, telling all different other people. Um, but I'm curious how you push that up the funnel a little bit further before you make that first purchase. Are you shooting the packaging and including that in the product listing? Are you just relying on, you know, customer generated content and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, reviews and, and whatnot to kind of bring some of that perceived value back up further up the buying chain? Uh, or is it just, you know, you know, hopefully they they will give you that jump and take a chance on you and then they get the experience afterwards? Well, with this one, since they already had uh, some established sales, it still has right now uh, 1,250 reviews at 4.8 stars. That's not bad. You know, when you, and the reason why is the, the product was researched, the brand owner did his research and he knew his audience. And I think that's uh, before you get out and you start creating a brand, if you don't know that avatar uh, it's going to be tough for you. And nowadays it's, it's a lot easier. I mean, you could go into chat GPT and you can create a persona uh, very easy compared to the old days where it used to take me days to come up with something, but now you can have multiple personas that you can have for your product. And uh, like for me, so I have, I have some beauty products and uh, 
one of the products I have, uh, it's soap. And I can take a bar of soap. And I know here in North America, uh, the average soap that I'm selling is around $10. I know in Hawaii, I can, or I know I can take the Hawaii soap that I use, sell it in Japan for 24 to 36 bucks because the Japanese love soap. I also know that I can go to Mutters. These are guys that are insane, crazy people that love to just do crazy obstacle courses, get filled with mud, covered with mud. And we tell them to get clean with mud and we sell them Dead Sea Mud soap. But we can sell it at double the price because it's a special soap. That's the same soap that you can get uh, from the other bars at $10, but these ones are 24 bucks. They just like walking around with mud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the guys are crazy. But uh, these are all these little things that you can do to really um, work on those personas. That's the first thing. Take time, understand the persona, and then even dig a little deeper. What uh, I've got uh, a product just behind me that a, uh, a, a physiotherapist came up with. He just did it for his clients and he put it on Amazon. He thought, oh, I'll just sell 10. Well, uh, one, what is it? $1.2 million in seven months, well over two months at uh, $2 million in a year, this guy grew. But what he found was his market share was getting taken away. And it sounds like a long-winded story, it kind of is. But what I noticed is that the colors that he was using is not true to fitness. When he was the only brand out there doing this, no problem. But when new brands were coming out that did do their research and found out that the true colors, they were eating up his market share. So when we looked at it, we said, well, he's, he's he uses all purple. Well, you don't, and, and purple hues and people, you don't want to look like the incredible Hulk. You know, it really, it just looked ugly. And so we, we told him about that, but he still wanted his purple, but we changed it where there was uh, the yellows and reds with a hint of purple. And then we turned it around and we could see that the market share was starting to increase again, going back to normal. In fact, uh, I think he said in the first month we did that, uh, his sales went 100% back to where they were. That's amazing. Just from color. Wow. I love to ask, I feel like it's so rare that we get to speak with someone who is not just a flash in the pan, digital marketing. You've been here for a couple of years. You made your, your money and you jumped out of it and you're done. But, you know, self-described fossil. I would really love to ask you, have you seen any patterns or anything that really jumps out at you over the years? I know you're, we're talking about perceived value. How has that changed now that we're looking at 2023 versus what you were seeing back when you were getting started. I imagine some of it stays the same with human psychology, but I imagine some of it has, has really changed. Well, the, there's been a huge shift, at least on Amazon. You used to be able to throw any, I call them me too products up there. You'd go to a manufacturer, uh, people were having these trips over to China and you'd meet with it, you know, all these different suppliers You'd buy 100, 500, and you throw it on Amazon. And if, if it's stuck and you got sales, you'd buy more. Can't do that anymore. And even with what I'm talking to you about these, uh, uh, like with the boxes and having a nice listing, that's not going to cut it. What we really need to do, and I'm going to go back to the knives, um, we, needed, we need to have a shift. And one of the things that I do, for example, for my domain, if I have a domain and I can't get the .com, which nine times out of 10, I can't, I'll look for a club, .club. Why? Because it references a community. And if I can get somebody to be part of my community, then I'm starting to build the brand. So what we did with the knives is we thought, okay, how can we take advantage of this? And we really want it to grow wide. Right now we have... 10 or 11 knives that they can choose from and re tons of repeat customers. Now, here's how we did it. We built the community. Uh, we spent a little bit of time uh, and more like a lot of time on the brand story and building the brand culture. That's important. Uh, but at the same time, we went out to chefs 
And we went out to chefs around the world and asked them if we could give them the knife to, to try. And if they liked it, could they give us a recipe? If they really liked it, could they give us a video? But uh, we ended up getting a ton of recipes. We went to culinary schools. We gave the students uh, knives, um, one condition that they write recipes for us. So what we ended up doing is coming up with two recipe books, one from around the world and one that was just uh, general um, recipes. But the other thing we did is we created a 52-week meal plan. And that meal plan was sent out, well, we drive the person over to the site from an insert. So in the box, we had an insert for um, a lifetime warranty and a special gift. They came over and they'd get uh, one or two uh, cookbooks. But even for added value, here's a 52-week meal plan. Now, people are going to give us their email. Who wouldn't? It, we're not telling them for something schlumpy, right? It's an added value product that people really could use. And we spent a ton of time uh, getting really high quality um, graphics and photography. When you look at meat, it actually looks like meat. You know, it was a product photographer that did it for us. And now people love this. When they come, we've got all these email addresses that not only can we put into a regular email that's going out, anytime we have a new product, all we have to do is pop it out in our email, promote it, give it to them for five or 10% less. And we've got, that they're going to buy the product because they've bought everything else. So we've got these brand ambassadors without really being a brand ambassador. And also it does help when people talk about influencers. So this is another part. Influencers weren't around. He, he just never went out and I mean, I guess there were brand ambassadors, but they never used that name. Now we're using influencers. And by having those 69, or let's say, I, I'm just going to say 69,000, but 69,000 emails, there's at least 1% of those people that are buying everything that you have in a brand ambassador. We can approach them and say, hey, how would you like to get a 50% discount? Can you put it through your network? Now we're getting more exposure. So these are certain things that uh, I see other brands not having a clue on. And that's the way that the games change. The ones that are increasing the customer experience, they're the ones that are going to, to really make it. If I'm competing about, uh, against 10 other knife people and they're not doing the same thing that we're doing, they're not going to get the same sales or the repeat customers. You brought something up that I feel like I might want to clarify because you said that they purchase and then you sent them the product and then essentially are soliciting the email after the fact. Why would that happen? If normally, if they're purchasing, they're giving the email is it's with Amazon, right? Like you kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing that you have to work around to kind of get the customer information after the purchase because it is basically Amazon's information yeah. initially. Is that how that works? So if you're selling products on Amazon, they're Amazon uh, customers. So uh, all we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, we can, uh, if we've got new products coming out, we're either on Amazon or just on our store that we can promote it. Uh, so we'll take a, an insert with a QR code, drive it back, over to a web page that asks if they want an extended warranty. And we provide them with these uh, books at recipe books and meal plans. Uh, so that really helps out uh, getting, getting as many emails as possible. Uh, we are also putting out a, a news newsletter. So foodies love, you know, recipes. And uh, so we have a lot of great content in there. One other thing, by the way, at least on Amazon, and you can do this with your social media, uh, but on Amazon, they have something called Amazon Posts. And people don't usually use it too effectively. We put out three to five posts a day, and we usually include at least uh, a recipe. So people love getting our posts because there's recipes. But we also look at Amazon Posts as a... Uh, 
another social, it is, it is another social media platform, but you're limited with what kind of content. But we know that we can have at least five to seven different types of content that's that goes out there from polished images. You can feature uh, the features, the benefits, lifestyles, recipes, and you mix it up. And what we found is that people definitely like the recipes, but unpolished lifestyle pictures, people go crazy over. And not the polished stuff, not the stuff that's done in the studio. And here's an example. We put out within one month, we got 200,000 impressions off of this crazy looking image of this lady holding up this knife with this cycle look in her face, but she just held it up. And I thought, let's just put it in there for fun. It turned out to be our best image ever. And so now you know that you can go back and people like that, you can start taking those um, different looking images and put it up there. And people are at least taking a look at it and clicking through. We can't get the sales, but we know that they've come through and they've gone through. Well, this is, you know what I love? This is, we're, we're talking about e-commerce here. A lot of people don't understand this, that every time you click, you lose huge pieces of audience. Amazon's made it four or five clicks before you can get to the page to buy. So I look at it as Amazon's trying to go. So you see the post, you click on either the logo or the category or the image. You go over to the brand feed. You click on it to get the summary. You click on the summary to go to the product page, and then you can buy. Why are they doing that? They wanted a captivated audience, somebody that's Oh, this is interesting. They like it and it goes over to the page. So your conversions must go up. I don't have any proof that they do, but they've got to go up. And if we're putting out um, posts that now the average is around two to 3,000 uh, impressions, not 200,000 because there's a lot more, but we're getting a lot more than the usual. And if you're doing that three to five times a day and you're getting just two sales a day, you know, it's, it's doing great. And the fact is you can post just for 14 days. And I guarantee you, if you go back one year later, you're going to see that those posts that you've put in have definitely gotten you sales because you'll see the amount of pressions and the amount of people who have clicked over to your, your listing. It's crazy. That's awesome. I feel like that's a nice, like a, it's like a new area, right? Everybody always talks about like how Facebook ads used to be so powerful five years ago, but now they're, you know, as it's getting a little oversaturated, they're getting more expensive. And it's not just like the kind of, you know, free money that it once was. It's it's nice to kind of hear about these kind of new, new areas where if you get out there a little bit early, I don't know if that's, you know, still a growing channel. Um, but if you can, you know, take advantage of it now, you know, there might be still some some room to arbitrage in there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's, and uh, I'm going to go down a different rabbit hole here for a second. But if you want free traffic, and really free traffic, and I'm not talking Google Shopping, but within Google Business Profile, if you go down and add your photos and add a link to your Shopify page, to your Walmart page, to your Amazon storefront, and your Amazon listing. Well, guess what? These are shoppable videos that you can do for free on Google. Now, are you Money. talking, so we're talking, is this like the through a merchant center scenario? Or are you talking about the Google My Business profile directly? Google Business profile directly. Awesome. And do you, um, so I know we've we've messed with that here and there for clients that have a brick and mortar, as well as, you know, the, the e-commerce channel. Um, are you using it for any kind of pure e-commerce uh, or do you always have to have the, you know, brick and mortar location to tie it to? No, uh, as of, I've always, for years and years, I've told people you could absolutely do it as a brand. And for years and years, I've always, every time I said you could do it, 10 people could said, you can't, you're not a bricks and mortar store. Yeah. So I'd, I'd always go, 
check with brands.google.com. And then they'd come back and say, oh, I apologize. But <laughs> but anyway, um, now when you if you start a new account, it actually says, are you an online store? Really? Yep. That's something we're going to have to go back and, and review. I know Lindsay and I, we had a, a funny story at a client a few years ago um, who were selling you know some products right out of their farm. Um, and they had, you know, went through and, and whatever through the process, they had to enter a, an address and they didn't have a brick and mortar store. So they just added the farm. And they told us a story a few months later of, uh, you know, a couple was here from Germany, I think, and like sought them out and found their, their little farm <laughs> and they just came and knocked on their front door. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so, good. That's so hilarious. It's a, it's a business. <laughs> Sorry, it's, a business, but it's not that kind of business. Uh, yeah. Most people, uh, where they get declined is they put a fake address in thinking that, yeah. Oh, I'm an online store. I don't want people coming to my house. <laughs> oh, you have to do it. You have to put your address in and uh, look at Google recognizes post office box. Even if you say it's an apartment or a unit, uh, they're going to nail you and they're going to decline you. So you can uh, put in like a home address and then yeah. just mark it as an online business. And that won't be customer facing. Yeah, and there's a checkbox. Don't show oh, address. So uh, the more information you can give, the better. And this also, uh, an another part that I like about uh, Google Business Profile is the ability to geofence. So you can, let's say you're that farm. You could sell specifically in a, a city, a region. Uh, you can go out as deep or as wide as you want. You can go nationwide, statewide, countywide, and you could just target 20 different regions and it'll only show the ads then. Um, I do have a, a really cool tip. Uh, not too many people know about this. So if you're in Google My Business, or Google My Business, Google Business Profile, and you're filling out your description and you're filling out your contact information, um, the, the one of the tabs is going to be talking about the time you're open. So everybody that's online goes 24 seven. That's the worst mistake you can make if you only leave it as 24 seven. So what I tell people to do is go in, find statutory holidays, find everything that you can think Canadian holiday. If you're coming to Canada, if you're going into the U S pump them all in there. So you get to tag all these, you know, these uh, holidays. Well, what happens to your competitor if it's 24 seven default and it falls on Thanksgiving, guess what's not being shown. And if you show that you're open, guess what's being shown. So it's 24 seven, leave it as 24 seven, but make yeah. sure to update that you're, you're open for these different holidays and different yeah. things. Because so it's just like, and, and we came across this a couple of years ago when it would just came up for food. My kids came in. So we were looking for a place where we kind of met in the middle. Nobody knew where any restaurants were. So we started looking around. We had one that we really liked. And it it said that it were they were closed. And it was um it was one of the holidays. Anyways, when we phoned them, they said that they were open. And then I came back and I, what the heck? And I just kind of was, maybe this is a way that you can get around and get, because you, 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 all it showed you on the, the listing was that you were closed. Yeah. And you would, I wouldn't have, if I didn't call, never would have gone to the restaurant. And so what I found for brands yeah. is they don't show. Yeah. Hmm. That's a it's a, an interesting area. We'll have to go back and revisit that with some of our brands and make sure that we have that uh, that Google My Business set up. Yeah, I think one, one thing, thing that oh, go ahead. Take it away. You got it. <laughs> uh, one thing I think is an interesting point that I feel like is maybe like a thread throughout what you're speaking about is being an early adopter to some of these um, different initiatives that Amazon posts and Google's different 
it changes constantly on their offerings. And I think a lot of times business owners are like, I'm too busy. I'm getting an email from Google that says, try out this new feature that we've got or sign up to be an early adopter for it. And they're like, I'm just too busy. I don't think it's going to give me any ROI. I don't know anything yeah. about it. I'm confused about what it means. I'm just going to delete this email and move on. Um, I think about, I used to work at a spa downtown here in Asheville. And it was at the time when Google was starting to really figure out how to measure people physically in stores. And so they could give that time frame of like, it's busy at this time. It's not as busy at this time. And they were sell, or they were sending um, local businesses free little trackers that you could put in your locations that would show how many people basically were coming into your store. And because they were offering it for free, we were like, okay, we'll give it a shot. And I don't have anything other than anecdotal evidence to, to say this. Our listing was always up the top. We were always shown we were this early adopter to this new piece of technology that made it easier for people to see whether it was going to be busy in our store or not. And I think it was like a great example of if you're an early adopter to these things, much like the Amazon posts, it can really work in favor for your business. And sometimes it does take like a little bit of work on the front end to like figure out how it works and to incorporate it into your workflow. But I think people should be less scared about trying these kinds of things, even mm. though it does seem constant and ever evolving and a little exhausting. But I think sometimes you strike gold. I strike gold all the time. <laughs> uh, it, there's so many things like just take a look at the new, uh, I'll say AI, but so broad. There's so many things happening out there right now. The expansion of ChatGPT with ChatGPT4, with Dolly3, um, with all the plugins. Uh, my favorite, by the way, uh, by far, is this data analyzer. That's crazy. Yeah, The information it can give you <laughs> Uh, we've, we've, one of the things that we've done is we've taken the, anything like terms and conditions or TOS, we've, uh, put it into chat GPT. So it recognizes, uh, our listings that we're putting up and it'll tell us whether we're within TOS or not. And we do that with Walmart and we do that with all sorts of things. Another thing that we've done, you saw my little note taker when we first started, yeah. Well, we can use that or Descript. And I have a VA that goes out. I uh, I don't want to, I I don't want to go and listen to, you know, 45 or a week long virtual summit uh, and get, you know, four or five nuggets. So what I, I used to do in the past is just have my VAs do it. And then they would summarize what we should implement in the company, what they thought we should. But now what I do is... All I, I do is I get the, the note taker or I get the script to go back, listen to the recordings and summarize the recordings. And then my VA can go back and decide whether we should implement it and then we'll create an SOP and then we'll put it into action. But it cuts, it's, it's cut down weeks and weeks of work uh, just from this, you know, just from January. It's amazing the, the efficiencies we're finding with that. And it, yeah. it really, I mean, it's both efficiencies. And then I think a lot of times the efficiency unlocks the ability to do extra things and try different things that, you know, in the past you would have just said, hey, it just can't even do that or even try that because it's just too much time investment on the front end. So it unlocks kind of a whole new um, area of, of experimentation. Right. But uh, yeah, it also, uh, no matter what I do, I don't know about you, but no matter what I do, it does not decrease the hours in the day. There's all, <laughs> I've always thought that four hour work week, always been grasping for it. I have not found it. Never. No. <laughs> I just want to highlight really too what you, uh, or what you pointed out. I think that's a genius way to use this um, to compare what you're doing to terms of service. Because I think a lot of business owners miss out that when you accidentally get caught by an AI, maybe it was like a mis a miscalculation or a miscategorization, and suddenly your account is taken down, and then you're having to deal with support for days, sometimes weeks. That's a genius way to just make sure that you're not going to trip over that because a lot of times it's unintentional. It's an AI, just like miscalculation, like I said, but it can really take down your business for a while while you're trying to fix it back up. So I just want to kind of highlight that that's genius. I love that idea. Thank you. Uh, the, the other thing that I can say, at least for Amazon, is that because other people are breaking TOS, 
So I, I get this a lot when people are looking at the primary images where they have backgrounds or they're doing something that they shouldn't. Well, they're still up. Well, what you'll find is that Amazon will do a broad sweep and all of a sudden, all of those people will be suspended or suppressed all at once. And then, and we saw this, this was crazy. We saw this with bullets. And I don't know why this is the first time I ever saw Amazon go crazy with suspensions over bullets, but it was always images you might get suppressed, something in your title you might get suppressed. But one day they just hit up, I think it was 10,000 uh, accounts uh, because they were using emojis and uppercase. Now we did that too. We didn't get caught, but we did change everything um, after that. And now you're starting to see everybody going back to, to uppercase again. But out of the blue, your account was suspended, not suppressed. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. One thing I'm I'm dying to ask this. So we've we've covered a ton of ground. We've gone into all these different areas of experimentation, areas of you know, looking at different ways to increase perceived value. Uh, we didn't dive too deep into, you know, dropping sourcing costs. But I'm curious if we can get specific on, you know, a lot of the brands we work with are either bootstrap brands or founder-led brands where they're coming in, they're looking for some agency help. They know, hey, we need some help on the marketing side. Um, we're working with them, you know, say we're doing Google Ads or an overall strategy audit or something to that extent, um, you know, Personally, from like the agency side, I have a selfish uh, uh, question around like, well, how do we start to, within the scope and capacity that we have to offer service, get some extra room to add all these things on and bring all these extra areas of value? Um, but I think, you know, really for our listeners, it goes the same from the brand side. It's like, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many, you know, investment dollars if you're handing it over to an agency. How do you find a path to knowing either what to experiment with first, or, or do you have kind of a, I'm pretty amazed at the breadth of everything you discuss. you know, take the knife company for, for instance, but at the same time, I'm sure you didn't just do all those things all at once. You know, I'm sure you weren't contracted initially to do all of that soup to nuts out of the gate. You know, how, do, how does that kind of relationship go? either for an agency or, or just thinking through, you know, the, the, the service offerings and the service, um, the items that you should be checking off and experimenting with as you go. Well, for us, it's, it's definitely all about systems and the way that uh, we did it. And if you're a brand, uh, one of the things that I would suggest you do is get Loom and just talk into Loom every repeatable thing that you think is possible. So that's the first thing. And then when you do get to the point where you're hiring of your first VA, you can show them that, uh, you know, this is the SOP on this. This is how I did this. This makes it very easy. But my key uh, for growth is making sure that the training is there. Uh, the, where I find that uh, a lot of sellers will fall back is this it's called the entrepreneurial roller coaster i think that's what uh, michael gerber called it in the e-myth and that's you're so passionate about your product you know everything about your product you're working 25 hours a day you bring in a va they don't do anything right because they're not properly trained you scream at them you let them go you take it back and it just it's a constant cycle it never gets fixed so the very first thing is to make sure that you train somebody and you train somebody properly and you allow them to make mistakes. Number one. Uh, so that's the first thing. Train a person who, let's say it's your general VA, or maybe it's somebody that's involved with your PPC, or uh, it could be other forms of marketing or launch and rank, uh, listing optimization. You might have, you might expand out to the point where you have one person that heads up those um those uh, areas if you're an agency. So the one person is always trained. Now we do, what we all do is we'll create a uh, an org chart followed by a task board. Every possible repeatable task is on that task board. Then we assign a dollar amount. So it's 10, 100, a 10, 100, a thousand, 10,000. So everything that we can possibly get out there and train 
goes out to those $10 jobs. We want those easy, repeatable tasks off our chest. And then the next one at a hundred, that might be a graphic artist. Um, the 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 next a thousand might be somebody in PPC. The ten thousand is you growing the vision of the company, networking, the strategy. Uh, so that's the first thing that we do. Then everything is has an SOP. I've got an SOP, and I shouldn't even call it an SOP. It's a policy and procedure. SOP is part of a policy and procedure for coffee. When you walk into our office, we had 23 people in the office. We all had to know how to make the perfect cup of coffee and why. And it was funny because everybody was, "What? this is so stupid. What are we doing? But then we realized that you had your buy-in. So the start of the policy, what's the buy-in? So it builds the culture. Everybody agrees. The prerequisites. What do you have to know to make a cup of coffee? Um, any um, uh, definitions? So, and I know with coffee, you don't have to do this, but definitions, then the SOP. And then the SOP has as many steps, not short steps. If, if you think it's going to be 10, it's going to be 20 steps. And then you have uh, the reporting and the quantification. So within that SOP, I like to take screenshots. And I like to um, have these very long uh, SOPs because if somebody's going to make a mistake, you can zero it into step number 12. And then you can go back and train. So this is, this is our biggest secret, okay? And it's not a big secret. Everybody can do it. They just don't do it. We spend time with building out or somebody, whoever's the head of the department, heads up building the SOP. They then talk to the person, um, the, the, the next VA or whoever we've hired to understand it. They repeat it back. Then they are let, they, they go and they do their thing. And then once their t- first task is done, it's reviewed and you can see what they've done. If they've made a mistake, if they've made a mistake, you're not expected to, as the trainer to fix it. You want that person to come back to you with the answer. Now, if it's wrong, that's fine. It's wrong. But you don't want to be the person putting out the fires. You want the trainee to come back to you so that they understand it. Uh, we have a three-point system. The first one, doesn't matter what it is. They And this has happened. A person's made a $23,000 mistake. It's educational. And I've had to eat twenty three grand. And if I would have screamed and yelled at a person, I might have lost a really good person. We have a, I mean, there's one thing in our company, no screaming, no yelling. Uh, You know, we have to talk to a person as a human and let them make mistakes because they grow from that. And they have to be confident that they can come back and talk to you and not, you know, be worried that they might say something wrong. That's the first thing. But they come back, they make the mistake a first time. It's educational, no problem. The second time, same thing. It's educational. The third time, that's probably not, it's not your task to do. This is not your strength. Something's up here. But you might find during those three strikes is that it's Amazon that's changed. It's not the person's fault. You know, it's great that we caught on it, but that is the person who is supposed to be quantifying the task. So we'll put it every three months, six months, every month. Uh, And so there's a person responsible for cleaning up all the SOPs. Because what, how good is an SOP if it's a year out and it's a completely different interface? Completely different, yeah. You know, and then um, another area for us is... Uh, probably naming protocol is one of the most important things that you can do. Okay, where are they? We know we use a, a, an, a, an app called Teamwork. And so with every client that we have, we have the where the SOPs are. So you go into the client, if you um, are writing a, a task list, uh, part of it is if you have not, if this is the first time, if this is the first time writing this task, uh, click here to see the SOPs. When you click on it, you go up and you see the policy and procedure. It's PP and then whatever the code name is. 
Then you have the templates. Are there any templates associated with it? Then you have the training. And uh, so they have everything in one area. They have a video so they, they can watch. Some people are more visual, but it's so important that you have all that. And then that puts, um, the, I guess you could call it the tools for to succeed. They're there for the person to succeed. And by the way, everybody in the company, 100% are taught how to write SOPs and how to better their own department. Oh, and the last thing I can add is that uh, we provide one hour of training regardless. It could be knitting. We hope it's about their job, but we have one hour of knitting per day that the um, that all of our uh, team works with. So they can go and take something in social me media. They're doing something over in digital marketer. Uh, we pay for everything. And, um, you know, it just helps make our team excellent. I love that. I love that clearly you've put enough thought. I was I was not expecting such a thorough answer from the project management side. And I think that is really telling that like, you know, it doesn't just happen. It does not like the, you're talking about these really cool tactical ways that you can improve different brands. And, you know, it almost seems unattainable to be able to knock all those things out, but it's all built up on that foundation of you've got to be able to offload tasks and you have to have a smart, smart plan in, in place to be able to offload those tasks. Otherwise, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Like you said, I love that entrepreneurial roller coaster. You're gonna end up just taking it all back on yourself at some point if you don't put the time in to uh to train oh, up, yeah. develop the yeah. SOPs. Well, one other thing, if you you don't mind, I don't know how we're doing for time, but um going back to VAs. So I've gone and it really gets under my skin when I hear people talking about, oh, try to get this person. Like you guys are paying four dollars an hour. I'm doing it for two dollars an hour. Well, good for you. You're against everything that I'm a I'm a, about when it comes to uh, VAs. And that is, if I'm sell, if first of all, if there's 20 hours for a VA, I'm hiring them full time. If it's under 20 hours, then we'll just hire them up to. It could be just a project by project, but I really like to take people on full time, and. When I go out, I usually um, find a company that vets them for me. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want my team wasting my time. I want good people. I get them vetted. And uh, it costs a little bit, but I'm good with that. Uh, then when we have them during the, uh, the interview process, uh, we just want to make sure that they have a screenshot of their cell phone, uh, of their computer, and of their internet. Because if you're paying... Uh, I said $4. So if you're paying $4 and their computer's so slow that you're really paying them $20, it doesn't make sense. So if we really like a person and they have a slow computer, the first thing that we'll do is we'll automatically ask them to upgrade their internet and we'll pay the difference from what they are now to whatever the uh, high speed is. The other thing is computer speed. So if their computer sucks, uh, we'll just say, look, go get a refurbished computer or get, get a computer. We're picking up the cost. And uh, the, the, there is one glitch. And that is you got to last over a year. If not, then you pick up the cost. And if they're good with it, then we're fine with it. And the other thing is if they're expecting four bucks an hour, uh, we're giving them six bucks an hour. Because, uh, and we check it out on job boards, what we think that these jobs would be paid. But if you've got somebody, and this happens, especially in the Philippines, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it's the, I've got an emergency. So a family emergency always happens. Philippines are famous for this. I've got a family emergency. Well, that family emergency is just somebody paying them a buck extra to get their job done. And, uh, you know, we, in the early days, we've kind of figured that out. So now we want to make sure that the people that are working with us feel secure, that they can go to a job. They don't have to worry about uh, what's happening, you know, the next day or putting food on the table. So if you pay them a bit extra and you give them a bonus once in a while, you'll be surprised. I'll, I'll give you a story. And this isn't anything to pat myself on the back, but some one of uh, the ladies that work with us were having a baby. She was completely stressed out, stressed completely out. 
And so when I asked my son, what, what's going on with this lady? She goes, oh, she's going in the hospital. She's going to have her baby. And uh, so why are we not paying for this? So we paid for it. You know how much it was? 200 bucks. $200. And, incredible. and she was expecting to come back the next week. It's like, are you kidding? You know, take some time off. And we have, and that, that's the other thing. When you do this, right, you have other VAs that can overlap and know exactly where the person is to pick up on their jobs. So that's good for holidays, but it's also good when medical issues come up. I feel like that's such a valuable message too. I mean, especially for VAs, I feel like we hear that all the time of like, okay, you know, like you said, is it, am I paying $4 an hour or $6 an hour? It's like, well, if you're paying under $10 an hour, chances are it really doesn't matter the dollar value. So like whatever you can do to kind of understand someone's personal situation and give them, you know, a fair and even a more than fair rate, it's, you know, it's easy to almost double somebody's pay in a lot of ways. And it doesn't really add any real cost to your side. If you've got somebody who is, you know, dependable and understands and, and knows that you're looking out for them and, and respect them as a person, I feel like you're going to get exponentially better work. Um, honestly, I mean, we, even the same on like a tooling side, sometimes people, will, you know, say, Oh, is it, is it $10 a seat? Uh, or, or I always get that with like different tools or chat GPT is a great example. You know, Oh, is it, you know, $20 a seat to, to get this? Or, you know, this other tool, this other project management tool is $15 a seat versus $20 a seat. It's like, if you're worrying about that $5 a month cost, then you've already lost the battle. Right. <laughs> a yeah. lot of these things, like if it gives you even just an ounce more efficiency, just pay for it, just go for it. And you're going to get, get the value out of it. So that's a, a really valuable lesson, I think. Yeah. Retaining, retaining your employees or contractors. That's so important. Definitely. Awesome. Well, we have covered a ton of ground here. I feel <laughs> like it's going to be uh, probably our longest episode to date. Um, I feel a little bit more comfortable cutting us off here because I'm going to be joining you on your podcast tomorrow on the Lunch with Norm podcast. Um, I guess by the time our audience hears this, it'll probably be uh, backwards. So feel free to go back in the feed to uh, if you want to get more of this conversation, um, go download Lunch with Norm and uh, look for our episode or any of the episodes as they are always valuable. Um, Norm, thank you so much for all of this. I think you've given us a ton of great insights. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, we could we could keep going on this. There's there's a, a a lot to learn from you. Hey, no problem at all. This has been great, and yeah, looking forward to having you on the uh, show tomorrow. Awesome. Um, can you tell our audience where they can find you and uh, what they'll find when they get there? Sure. Uh, so Norm Farrar. Uh, that's typically I'm the the norm out there with this long. Oh, if this is on the podcast, I have a a very long beard. I'm bald, very long beard. And if you check anything Lunch with Norm, you'll see all my social media. Um, so you can see me there. Uh, if you want to check out uh, one of the uh, other companies I have, I have a few companies, but the sourcing company is called Honu, H-O-N-U Logistics, uh, or sorry, Honu Worldwide. Uh, other than that, just look me up on social. Awesome. And Lindsay, would you uh, help read us out? Yeah. So thank you again so much, Norm. Really enjoyed the conversation today. And thank you to everyone who is watching and listening to Ecom Marketing with the Pitbulls. Remember to subscribe to get all of our podcasts and YouTube videos as soon as they're released. And if you're finding the show valuable, we'd also really appreciate a like on YouTube or a review on your favorite podcast player. And we will see you all next time. It's Andy. I'm here with Percy, the original PPC Pitbull. Thanks for checking us out today. If you're ready to take the next step in your digital marketing journey, come on over to ppcpitbulls.com and book a free strategy session. We'll take a few minutes to get to know you and your brand, and I promise you'll leave with actionable insights that you can implement today. Working together, we're going to get you on the right track towards reaching your unique e-commerce goals.